Welcome to The Way to Inclusion, How We Create Schools Where Every Student Belongs. I am so excited you all are here today with me, whether you are live or watching the recording. Um, my name is Dr. Kate McLeod, and my work revolves around inclusive education. Uh, I got my start as a high school special education teacher working in New York City. Um, and since then, I've been really committed to thinking, researching, practicing, supporting um, inclusive best practices, really PK to 12. Um, I am currently an associate professor of special education at the University of Maine Farmington. Um, go Beavers, if anybody in here is a UMF alum. <laughs> I see some of the books. Uh, <clears throat> I have... Um, written several books uh, around thinking about inclusive education. And today our focus really for this webinar is going to be using um, my co-author text, The Way to Inclusion, How Leaders Create Schools Where Every Student Belongs. And it kind of gives us a, um, a non-linear roadmap for really thinking through how we uh, do this work in our schools. And I'm, I'm super excited to share it with you. I also have, um, a, a lovely little family, and that's my my Sammy McLeod, who is uh, given the the hang loose and the thumbs up sign there in the photo, um, and you know thinking about how we want to support belonging and access. You know whether you are an educator, a, a community member, <clears throat> a parent, a grandparent. I think really keeping the focus on how we support belonging will be such a powerful initiative for this type of work. So I'm excited to get uh, going here with you. Our agenda for today um, is we'll walk through sort of a guide using the way, uh, the way to inclusion, <clears throat> which really thinks through seven key milestones around what do we do to really commit to and create and sustain inclusive schools? And then um, I'll talk a little bit about some things until our paths perhaps cross again that we can uh, connect in ways that you can continue to uh, build your network around thinking around inclusive education and inclusive schools. Um, I do have some resources that are gonna be directly from the book. Um, my co-authors and colleagues uh, run a company called Inclusive Schooling, and we have at this uh, website included all sorts of different resources that I'll talk about today that come directly from the book. Um, and you can also explore their website that has a lot of great stuff on it as well. Um, and then you can also email me at katemcleod at maine.edu for additional resources and things like that. And I'll have my email um, on the slides. And I know Anne-Marie and the DOE will be um, sharing the recording of this webinar as well as all the resources. So that will include the slides and they will all be housed somewhere for your access digitally. Does that sound right, Anne-Marie? Somewhere they'll be available? <laughs> yes, that's the plan. Okay, great. Um, so, as we think about inclusive education and sort of the idea of creating inclusive schools, um, we're going to be thinking about these milestones, and we'll, I'll walk through each of them with us uh, today, but this gives you a little bit of an overview of sort of thinking about why inclusive education, how do we look at our systems using an equity lens, do we have a clear public vision, uh, are we thinking about service delivery structures, really reimagining them to be more inclusive? Are we thinking about our schedules and our collaborative staff roles? Are we thinking about powerful inclusive classroom practices, think high leverage practices, um, and how are we providing ongoing support? So if these milestones um, can be met, and like I said, it's, it's not necessarily linear, <laughs> uh, but they are all really key to the work of creating inclusive schools. So we'll, we'll talk through this today. The very first, most grounding milestone is really creating a shared understanding of why inclusion is critical for all learners. So if you came here today thinking, oh, this is just gonna be about special education, um, what we really wanna think about is how inclusion is gonna benefit 
all. And when we do this work, we can look through a lot of different definitions. If you ask somebody to define inclusive education, you might get um, a different answer from everybody in your school. Does that sound maybe familiar? <laughs> and what we're doing with this definition, this is the definition that my co-authors, um, Julie Costin and Christy Pretty fremsack have created and that we use as a grounding force in our text. So I wanted to share it with you all, but also knowing that there are lots of different ways that you in a system and as a team can start to create your own shared definition of inclusive education. So you have similar language to draw from and to focus on. <clears throat> so... In this definition that Julie and Christy have, uh, I will read it out loud to you. And um, in the resources as well, you can have this and take this uh, to use and, and think through on your own. But inclusive education means that we no longer accept that separate classrooms, separate schools, and separate lives are in the best interest of any student. And separating people by ability disadvantages everyone. Belonging is a human need. So our educational system, practices, and spaces need to be reimagined. Inclusive education means that every student is valued because of their strengths, gifts, and challenges, and disability is simply diversity. Everyone benefits from meaningful participation and opportunities to learn grade level content with diverse peers. So we must trust that all students come to us as incredible whole people who do not need to be fixed. Now, something that I really love about this definition is the idea that um, often in, when we think about special education, we think about remediation, when we think about deficit. And so really thinking about a reimagining of what this can look like and what this can mean to celebrate all learners and really support them together can be a really powerful piece of this work. Um, and as we think about our own definitions and how we're thinking about inclusion, it's really important to with your community, with your staff, with your school, uh, with the people that you're talking about this work with, to really get clear on that why. Why inclusion? And there are so many different reasons people come to the work of inclusion. Some are personal connections and experiences. Um, some are thinking about the research, some are thinking about sort of those ethical reasons, that social justice reasons, that separate is not equal. Uh, some are really focused on thinking about the law and how we're, you know, aligning with the least restrictive environment. Um, some are really focused on belonging or community pressure or thinking about advocacy work. And so as you start to talk about this, why with your, your folks, your team, your school, um, it's really important that you can approach it from all these different angles. So of course, there is that least restrictive environment, thinking that our Individuals with Disabilities Act um, is you know, it, talking about how do we get learners in the least restrictive environment, the general education setting, as much as possible. Um, and when we're thinking about that, we can really understand the preference, the, the legal preference that has been set in so many different ways. And that could be a driving force um, to really engage in this work. It might be the research for some of you and some of your team members, thinking about how quantitative and qualitative research is evidencing that inclusion benefit, that it's all students, not just students with disabilities and across all disability categories, um, including students with the most complex support needs. And so this is really important to think about too, because often when schools and communities are thinking about inclusive education, sometimes they move in greater, uh, to greater inclusivity while still maintaining separate spaces for students with more complex support needs and more significant disabilities. And so understanding that the research shows that in fact, when students with more complex support needs are included, they make some of the most significant gains academically, socially, in communication skills. So really using that as a research lens can be powerful. Um, we also know that it impacts all ages, from our littlest learners to our high school folks across all subgroups. And this includes thinking about what does it look like to include students with gifted and talented needs um, and across all subject areas and, of course, all outcome types. 
the academic, the social, the behavioral, the communication. We increase attendance. Uh, we impact positive effects in post-secondary experiences, whether it's independent living, access to post-secondary education, um, access to post-secondary employment, all things that are going to create a more robust, diverse, beautiful, and inclusive society. Um, and so coming back to the research might be a place that's really powerful for your team's why. Um, maybe the why is an ethical social justice reason. If we think about the fact that um, nationwide, what we're really looking to do is serve learners um, with IEPs, with disabilities in the general education class 80% or more of the day. That's a real goal. And so right now in Maine, uh, only 54.92% of our learners with IEPs are included in general education 80% or more of the day. And that puts us as, as Mainers um, as the fifth least inclusive state in the country. So we have some real work to do. There's some real urgency around the work of inclusion in our particular state. Um, and the beautiful piece that uh, that I can really see when we think about this urgency is that when we commit to the systemic changes that we're going to talk about today, um, not only do our students with disabilities benefit, but all students um, and the educational system as a whole really benefits. So it could be that we're thinking about the state of the state as a why for your team. But the most important thing to do is to really start to think about what's my personal why? Why am I interested in doing this work? How might I explore the research more? And how am I gonna differentiate the why, right? So if I'm having, having a conversation with folks, um, I might bring up the law, I might bring up the research, I might bring up the concept of belonging or the social justice work or the need for change in Maine. Um, and it starts to give new conversation and new life to um, to how we approach this. Because sometimes when we talk about inclusion, there can be resistance or challenge, or we've never done it that way, or we tried it and it didn't work. And so having these conversations and really being able to differentiate can be really powerful. Now, one of the things that we've found, my colleagues and I, and researchers across the country as well, um, related to creating change in schools, um, particularly that might have more traditional special education structures in which students with disabilities are served in separate spaces, whether that's resource rooms, self-contained rooms, you know, special schools, et cetera, um, is really taking a good hard look at the system using an equity lens. And so our book, The Way to Inclusion, kind of maps out exactly how you can do this type of work. And so if you go to the resources page, um, you'll be able to access some of the data equity collection guides and things of that nature that we've created and shared, and you can use it to adapt and, and support your own work. Um, of course, you know, the book will go into greater detail or you can connect with me to say, what do we do? How do we do this? What's the plan? Um, but really doing this, work is so important for the system to get a real handle on what is going on in our school or our district or our program. And we like to talk about in our in our work, my, my co-authors and I, really thinking about what is the lens that we use to view disability? And because when we think about it, the lens, how do we view it? How do we understand it? How are we thinking about special education? it impacts the way we support, teach, and give access to students. So when we're thinking about the system lens, we want to really think a little bit about where are our learners served? How are we using staff? How are we creating more inclusion and equity? And so when we do this, we start to think about this, this idea of shifting from a medical lens to an um, equity lens, particularly in this, this idea here is thinking about disability. So special education, and as I mentioned, there's, there's sort of this traditional model that focuses on remediation. And often remediation is that this student has to go to a separate place to be remediated, um, their deficits. And that often is 
by a special educator specialist. And this medal, right, you have to prove that you're eligible to receive special education services and, and all, all of this type of an idea. And so when we really use this medical lens, we're really focusing on sort of individual pathology impairment. We're aiming to fix or remediate. Disability labels are seen as deficits. And often we're focusing on the label as the problem, and we're not really looking at the system. So then we're often ignoring some of the systemic inequities that we as educators and institutions uh, put into place and create barriers for our learners um, that we didn't mean to, but we do. So when we shift to the equity lens, we really start to think about how disability is a socially constructed identity. And we're focusing on what are those societal barriers that are really disabling folks? And we're providing just right supports as opposed to saying this person has a particular disability label, they must be served in this particular program, um, and not really thinking about what those just right supports and services can look like when we really reimagine the system. Um, and with the equity lens, we're really thinking about the disability as a natural difference. It is expected, it is human, it is part of um, what makes a community whole and diverse and beautiful. Um, and so it shouldn't be disability label seen as the deficit, let's focus on the label as a problem. Instead, we wanna focus on the system as the problem. And how can we name and address the systemic inequities that are in place? And what the system equity review, like seeing your system through this equity lens, this can allow your school, your team, um, your program to identify where are your strengths, how can you leverage them, and where are your inequities? And here, we're looking at the system as a whole. We're not looking at individual student deficits. We're really identifying where are our students served? How are they accessing general education? How are we thinking about interventions? How are we utilizing staff? Um, and so this will help you develop a clear understanding of where you wanna go next with your system. And when you think about that, you might start to see, okay, once we sort of understand where our strengths are, where our inequities lie, where we wanna go forward, we can start to develop an inclusive vision. And this inclusive vision can come from your inclusive steering committee, your inclusive steering team, you know, your integrated uh, multi-tiered systems of support team, whatever you want to call yourselves, but you want to create a diverse team that has many diverse voices and yes, includes student and family voice too. As you start to look at what did you find from looking at your system data? And how do we create something that is a public vision for inclusion that also identifies what are some of these system level changes we need to put in place? So your data, your data can give you the urgency to say, here are our findings, here are our next steps. So an example of a clear and public vision of a, of a school district that my co-authors and I work with is um, that we believe, we deeply believe that our collective differences are our greatest strength. Here we celebrate the fact that every classroom and grade level has a broad range of learners. We draw upon differences to educate our students together and we collaborate with all staff to support all learners inclusively in general education. So what this team wanted to do is they really wanted to name some of these ideas. Now this is the vision, right? You can then put into place uh, actionable goals and you know things that can be aligned with the strategic plan, uh, but you wanna have a clear and public vision that you can share and that you can use. And as, as you go through the webinar today, you'll see that there's, real clear ways that we come back to this vision when we're making decisions, daily decisions, moment by moment decisions in a school. So this particular administrator <clears throat> that we've worked with talked about creating a listening tour. So what they did, they looked at their data, they came up with a public vision and the public vision was focused on creating more inclusive opportunities for all learners, moving away from a system that 
separates and sort of segregates, and then also doesn't make the type of progress that we want for our learners with IEPs. Um, and in this particular director's instance, not only learners with IEPs, but um, multilingual learners as well, right? So they were looking at that data too. So they crafted their vision and they embarked on a nearly 20 school tour across the district, right? This is a pretty big district. <clears throat> and, and they talked to every faculty meeting. We made sure every single group heard the same clear and concise message. Our message included both our why, why are we moving in this direction, and our vision, highlighting key findings from the data that they had done in their equity review. They shared next steps and what these steps would mean for staff, students, and families, and we answered questions and provided listening sessions. Another key piece to understand about this is that they were operating from that inclusive steering committee, which was a diverse group of stakeholders from across the district that included educators, interventionists, general and special related service providers, students, families, leadership. So it wasn't as if this why, this vision, and then of course the data that they were looking through um, was coming from a top-down place or a place that folks weren't involved. So this is another key piece that can be really helpful for the work. Um, so <clears throat> she says, though this process was labor intensive, it demonstrated to each person that this effort was important and supported by the upper levels of administration. It allowed each school to ask questions in an intimate environment and communicated the vision from a single source rather than filtering it through scores of building administrators. So this can also be helpful because if it's a district-wide move, and we're really thinking about this. Now, will some buildings in a particular district move at different paces and prioritize different needs and action steps? Absolutely. But understanding that the vision is vertically aligned and connected to all can be really, really powerful. So if you're thinking through our milestones, we've got, why do we do this work? We've got, how do we see our system? I am setting off fireworks again. Um, how do we see our system? How do we share and, and sort of commit to a public vision? And then we get to some of the nitty gritty, which is how are we starting to realign outdated structures to create more inclusive ones? And this part becomes critical because we can set up a vision and we can identify our inequities, but if we don't look at our structures and think about how we are serving students with service delivery, uh, we're never gonna get to the inclusive place that we wanna be. So something that we can always come back to is that special education, folks, it's a service. It is not a place or a program, although often it is interpreted in that way, whether, right, it's a, a resource room or a behavior program or a program for students with autism. But what we really want to remember is that special education is a service. So this allows us to really reimagine those structures and be much more inclusive and creative when it comes to how we're serving our learners and how we're using our staff. If um, anyone was at the first session, you might have seen uh, these maps before, but I want to walk through them because it is that structural piece that a school can commit to, to really reimagine their service delivery that can be really, really helpful as we're thinking about resource mapping. So what you're looking at here is an elementary school. You can see the rectangles. These are general education classrooms, right? These are general education teachers. And we've got, in this elementary, it's a K through five. Then you can see that we have uh, circles, and the circles are special education teachers. And in many of these instances, they have their titles, which are really aligned with their room or their program or their place, right? See how that kind of sh shakes out? We've got the self-contained life skills teacher. We have the resource teacher one, research teacher two, research teacher three. And then we have the inclusion teacher who's co-teaching with two different general educators. Um, and so that's kind of like why they're over those two general education rectangles. Then you can look at the diamonds and the diamonds are paraprofessionals or here in Maine, ed techs. 
Um, so you can notice that the self-contained life skills class has four ed techs. This resource room has one ed tech. This general education classroom has an ed tech. Um, these co-taught rooms here have two ed techs. There's a resource room uh, that has an ed tech here, and then there's one over here in general education. Now, as many of us know, ed techs can be often more fluid than maybe just these stationary pieces. So, you know, they might be moving around. So if you're thinking about resource mapping, you know, identifying that can be helpful too. But what this particular elementary school did, as they were thinking about, let's reimagine our structures to be more inclusive, They did away with special education as a program or a place. And instead, they reimagined it to be service. They reimagined all learners to be general education students first in their general education classrooms. And then the teachers, the special education teachers, moved to support collaboratively with the general education teachers. And this is done strategically. And we can talk about that next, but you can see that now we have special educators who are co-teaching with multiple general education settings. To, and then you can see this is really kind of what we might call best practice, not always possible, but when you have co-teachers that nobody is really co-teaching with more than two or three general educators at a time, just to make it a little more seamless, a little easier. Um, now, this is really showing sort of full-time co-teaching where these teachers are spending the majority of their days supporting in these classrooms. But that is not the only way to restructure and reimagine service delivery, and we'll talk about that next. This is just a helpful way to think about uh, this particular elementary school reimagining. What's really also critical to think about is when they did this work, um, many things happened. <laughs> uh, and I, you know what? I'm thinking I can even put that study in our resources, which it's not right now, but it would be great to see. Um, because after three years, as they look at their data after this reimagining, they saw state assessments uh, scores increase significantly for learners with IEPs, for learners of color, for learners um, that are multilingual. And they saw their attendance rates increase. And they saw, um, in general, thinking about not only did sort of those assessment, but we could see when the teachers sort of did their additional data, they saw classroom assessments um, and sort of some of that more triangulated assessment data also increase for their learners. So we saw lots of great outcomes that we had sort of talked about in the beginning in terms of the research, um, but that's also really important to think about as you, as you commit to work like this, making sure you're keeping track of your data and you're sharing that out with folks so that we can really see and talk about what's going on, where some things that we're running into issues, um, how might we need to reimagine an elementary school schedule if we need more support on literacy, right? All these things come into play. So really making it data-driven as well can be helpful or critical, really. Um, so the structure and the schedule and the, the staff roles all fit together. You can't reimagine the structure if you're not also reimagining the schedule and collaborative staff roles. So this is another important milestone. And I'll tell you that my co-authors and I kind of went back and forth. Which milestone comes first? Do we think about the schedule and the roles first? Or do we think about the structure first? And we kind of went back and forth. And we landed on the idea that if we think about structure in a big picture, then we can start to think about the schedule and the cloud of roles to fit, fit those needs. And so that's how we landed here where we're thinking about how do we schedule inclusively. Now, this is a resource that we've got sort of uh, really clarified in detail in our, in our book, but that you can take this resource right from the resources that I shared with you um, and start to think about it and use it um, in your own schools and settings. But the idea is that you're strategically and flexibly scheduling all staff to serve all students more inclusively. So rather than cluster your special education staff, your intervention staff, your ed techs, 
um, in separate spaces and programs, you're starting to really think more collaboratively. And when you do this, as many of you already are doing, I would imagine, you're scheduling students first. And then you're scheduling educators. Because then what you're doing is instead of using programs and places, you're really thinking about meeting students' needs with those services and staff members. Um, so ideally, as you're walking through this, uh, you know, you, you really begin by scheduling students with the most significant support needs first. And you want to make sure that they are spread across in heterogeneous ways, really following what we would call natural proportions. Natural proportions um, is what you might imagine. You might have heard this term before. If you have 20% um, of your learners in the school that have IEPs, then no classroom should have more than 20% of learners with IEPs in it. What we often see in schools that are relying on more traditional models of special education, um, we see clusters of students and clusters of classes. And this is really K to 12, um, where we might have higher need students all clustered together because they're pushing into a particular class and they might have an ed tech support or at the high school level or the middle school level, we might have some tracked level classes. And so we have learners with and without disabilities who have higher support needs all in a lower level class. And what we really wanna think about is not only are we wanting to think about natural proportions for learners with IEPs, um, but we also want to think about balanced and diverse classes uh, for all students so that we have a range of academic behavior and social emotional needs across all classes. So we're not clustering and tracking because we know that this is a more effective way to serve learners and a more effective ways for teachers to teach. So it all kind of comes together there. Now, so we're scheduling our students with more significant disabilities first, then we're really thinking about levels of support. Um, and this might, you know, help you as you're thinking about plugging it in. Now, when I do scheduling with folks, it's all about getting those post-its out, really looking through everybody, getting really creative. Um, it could take a long time, but it is so critical to really set up the structure um, that's gonna make the most sense for your classes, your learners, and your students. You can also think about what this might do to case management and teachers who are supporting learners with disabilities and IEPs. Sometimes in schools, and this isn't to say that you can't continue operating like this, but you have teachers who might be supporting learners um, with behavioral needs, or you might be supporting learners with what we might at a school say resource level needs. And often when we start to think about more um, inclusive structures and we really think about more heterogeneous groupings and we're thinking about how are we using our staff most effectively, Sometimes cross-categorical support can be the most effective. So where we're thinking about special education teachers are supporting students with IEPs regardless of disability um, or level of need. And so then your caseloads and your teachers become potentially a little bit more equitable um, and a little bit more flexible. But not all schools choose to do it that way. And some schools still might prefer to use particular special educators to provide specific uh, disability label or needs-based support. So you just have to be strategic and you have to talk with your team about what's gonna make the most sense um, for your school, for your staff, for your learners. So as we're thinking about all this, um, after we do all the student scheduling, that's when we start to think about, okay, how are we using our potential staff? How are we thinking about our special educators, our related service providers, our you know, multilingual uh, learner teachers, our Title I educators, our specialists, our coaches, our interventionists. How are we really thinking about how we're supporting? Um, and then we're also then thinking about assigning paraprofessionals ed techs. And as much as possible, really thinking about how can they be part of the inclusive team as opposed to assigned as a one-to-one. -one. Right. This is another shift that we can start to think about. Um, so again, we're really supporting with the adults in the school in more robust and sort of collaborative ways. So as we do this work, 
there are some ways we can think about the special educator in a few different ways. So as you saw in the service delivery maps, um, that was really about full-time co-teaching with general education. And that's where, you know, we're thinking about it's a single class block or a period, it's all day long, it's somewhere in between. Um, but there's, of course, that consult consultative support. So it's a little bit more regularly scheduled in class support. Frequency is flexible. There's a lot of behind the scenes work. And then there is also the concept of an inclusion facilitator who's really coordinating services for students with more significant disabilities. So often we see that um, if a school is moving away from using a separate program for students with more complex support needs, that special educator who's been case managing those learners in a separate space might now serve as an inclusion facilitator. You've already sort of used, you know, naturally proportions, you've been really strategic about your scheduling across the building. Um, and then that person is really supporting working behind the scenes um, to serve as a resource, to create modifications, to really think about push in when needed. Um, and, and that's a way that we really like to see the inclusion facilitator used. So, this particular uh, idea, which is where, you know, we have like these particular roles, what I want everybody to think about is that these are flexible and fluid and that you have to look at the staff that you have uh, and the students that you have and figure out what's going to make the most sense for your particular school system. And it's not always everybody gets a co-teacher. Sometimes it's we're using, uh, you know, really strategic blocks and some folks have co-teaching and sometimes we're regrouping and using lots of different staff to think about it. Um, and it's it's all up to how we're thinking about schedules and support. But what all of this is, is really rethinking how we're using the special educator, not in a separate place for students, but really to support in more inclusive ways. And that's a collaborative role release and can be really exciting and so, so powerful um, for both the general educator and the special educator, and of course, for the students. In all of the research we hear, you know, students that have uh, special educator and general education teachers serving them, that uh, there's more individualized intervention, they feel more supported. It's so nice to hear from student voice when you think about that research too. Um, so that's another thing to consider as you're thinking about these more collaborative roles. Another piece of the schedule is of course, as we know, the master schedule. What is the building doing? How are we supporting the structure? Um, and so the key thing too, is that we're prioritizing all learners of general education students. That means they're in general education classrooms. We want to think about prioritizing universal support blocks. Many schools in Maine are already using these. And so really, um, if your school doesn't, thinking about what this could add and, and how to use it and how it helps to create more inclusion. Um, and then, of course, in the master schedule, too, prioritizing collaborative services and planning time. If you don't have planning time and you don't have time for folks to get together and meet between general education and special education teachers, it's going to be really challenging. So prioritizing that in the schedule is very, very critical. Um, a thing that, as you're thinking about the schedule, is the idea that intervention should not be in place of core general education instruction. So often we see that it is a replacement, but what we want it to be is supplemental or embedded into the general education setting. And so getting creative with your, with your schedule and your staff are ways to address that. Um, the resource that I have shared with you, they don't have the sample schedules, but I'd be happy to put them into a resource folder that, um, that Anne-Marie and, and the DOE can house as well, because I think it's really helpful to look at different levels, both elementary, middle, and high, and how they're thinking about master schedules that are doing some of this good work related to prioritizing um, general education instruction for all, universal support blocks, um, collaborative planning time, et cetera, at the different levels. This is an elementary school principal um, that is featured in our book and that we have worked with in the past, um, really talking about the schedule. So I want to just share it with you. It's highlighting a lot of things that I've just talked to you about in terms of best practices. Um, but the idea is that a concern that arises when developing an inclusive master schedule is how to ensure that students receive the specialized services they need while continuing to receive access to the general education curriculum, right? This is often the conundrum. 
So we combated this problem with a two-pronged approach. First, we intentionally structured general education class periods to ensure that research-based best practices were reflected in our instruction. We allocated instructional minutes in the literacy block to align with evidence-based reading instruction. We were better ensure that students were receiving strong tier one instruction, because remember, all students have to receive that strong tier one. Um, you know, special education services, tier two, that type of stuff, it shouldn't be a replacement for. So this also enabled us to provide in-class support from special educators, paraprofessionals, instructional speci and specialists at key times to maximize available resources. So this can look like staggered literacy blocks. This can look like lots of different things depending on your school's needs. Second, we developed an intervention and enrichment block as part of the master schedule. This was a time when any student could receive strategic support uh, or extension supports. By providing this block in the schedule, we were able to maintain the integrity of the general curriculum while also providing additional support and extensions in ways that didn't require any student to be tracked or to miss instruction to receive interventions and enrichments. Now, this is the goal. Because well, I was having a conversation with the superintendent the other day, we were looking at the data for, um, for all their students. And there was a comment around, well, students with IEPs, you know, maybe they might never make the type of progress um, that students without IEPs are making on some of these assessments. Um, that's why they have IEPs. But if we're always separating them from general education, and we're never giving them access to that good core instruction. And then guess what those assessments are testing them on? General education instruction and content, they never have the opportunity to really catch up and, and improve. And so when we start to move in this direction, we see assessment data increase. We see outcome data increase. So things to really think about as you're thinking about the schedule. In my opinion, the schedule and the services are the magic. And then you have, of course, your magical educators who, who bring it all to life. Um, but they can't do their amazing work if we don't put the structures and schedules in place that are going to allow them to do that good inclusive work. So once we have this, we're also making sure we're thinking about powerful inclusive classroom practices. And you know these are similar to those high leverage practices. We're thinking about is collaboration and co-teaching a system-wide focus? Are we really thinking about how we're sharing expertise? And we're no longer saying the special educators do their magic in a separate room and the general education teachers do their magic in a different room and neither the two shall meet. Instead, how do we share expertise? How do we share knowledge uh, and provide that together to serve all learners? Universal design for learning is a system-wide focus because we're setting all students up for success um, and we're really thinking about meeting a range of learner needs before we even have to do those individualized adaptations. So often we find that if we look at some of the accommodations that are in learners' IEPs or in their 504 plans, so much of these can be addressed really, really well through good universally designed instruction. And then all students are having access as well to some of these really good practices. So UDL is a focus in really inclusive schools. Individualized adaptations provide access to grade level standards and content. This is a key piece of the work because if we're individualizing students learning, but we're never helping them access grade level standards, grade level content, and then of course that grade level setting alongside their peers, uh, we're doing them a disservice and we are not meeting their needs. That's not to say we're not scaffolding and supporting, but we really want to be aligning to how do we get them to connect to that grade level standard and content. Um, and this, uh, one more thing that comes into mind here is that sometimes there's a conversation around having to um, be ready for general education to prove that you're ready to access it. And what often happens is if, we, if we're using that as our lens, we're never giving students the opportunity um, to, to be there in the general education setting accessing the grade level standards and content in a way that is going to, in fact, help them achieve and progress much more effectively than if we were saying they have to prove they're ready in a separate place first. So there's these, this other piece to that. They're thinking about natural supports too. And this is a, another 
thing to consider as you're looking at your practices and, and you know, in your educational spaces, how are we leveraging um, peers? How are we le leveraging materials, sort of invisible supports, and not always the adult support, so that we can think about belonging, that we can think about independence, um, and we can think about all of these amazing resources we have in our general education classrooms that we might not be using. And then, of course, we want to think about behavior supports, because often behavior is a key piece of why students are not included in general education, because we know it's so interconnected to the idea of what if they can't access? What if it's too challenging? What if it's too boring? What if they are not, you know, being able to regulate? All these different pieces come into play. Um, and so we want to make sure that our supports are compassionate, that they're restorative, and that they are focused on inclusion, and that those all are connected to the work. This also means that we have to have real beautiful conversations with all staff to understand that no longer are we just saying the kid has a behavior need, they need to leave the classroom. Instead, it's this student has a behavior needs, what are we going to do to support them so that they can access, so that they can stay, so that we can really think about this work uh, in a collaborative way. And that is not to say that there are not really, really, really challenged behaviors that exist. I know I've worked with students in that have incredibly significant challenging behavior, but the idea is that we want to connect all these pieces together. And what we find again and again and again is that when we focus on inclusion, we think about collaboration, we think about universal design, we think about peer supports, we think about individual adaptations, we think about belonging, we see behaviors go down, we see them decrease. Um, and so all of these pieces are interconnected. My favorite part, perhaps, is thinking about what type of ongoing support are we providing everybody when we're moving towards a more inclusive system? Because we can set up the why, the vision, the structure, the collaboration, the schedule. We can set up professional development around the practices, but we have to continue the work. If you think back to, there was a, um, a director of special education who did the listening tour that I mentioned earlier, um, where they, they went around to all 20 schools and talked about the vision for inclusion in that district. That district is currently on year 14 or 15 of really sustaining their inclusive movement. And every year, the ongoing support is most critical. How are we identifying the needs and the supports in an iterative way, in a responsive way, um, and not just saying, hey, we set up the schedule, we set up the collaboration, like everything is going to be good, um, because it, it can't, it's not that linear. So something to really think about is we have to support everybody through the change, particularly in Maine, where a lot of this is, a, a lot of our structures can be, um, are much more traditional, and so it might be very new for some folks. Now, that's not to say every place in Maine is like that. Um, but the idea that we have to support everyone through change is so critical because change is hard and staff and folks and families must feel seen and supported. And that means we have to give them the support, the time and the resources to implement these practices. Like I said earlier, if we set up a schedule where we're going to have people co-teaching and collaborating and consulting, and then we don't give them any time to co-plan together and connect and meet as a team and look at data, we are going to struggle. And those teachers are going to not build the type of relationships with each other that we want them to be able to build. We also need to think about the fact that inclusion is not a special education thing. As we've talked about today, yes, we're talking about students with disabilities and really thinking about structures, but we're thinking about all learners and we're thinking about all staff members. And when we do this work, we are reimagining the way we we support everybody. And so it's really a system-wide transformation. The third point that came up again and again and again in uh, conversations with leaders that have been doing this work is that you have to stay as long as it takes. That's because humans need to experience a sense of well-being, right? They have to feel like they are safe enough to be vulnerable, to share concerns, 
um, and then to eventually have that support to accept different ways of doing things. So if we're thinking about staying as long as it takes, that's continuing to have the conversations, returning to your why, which brings me to this piece. Some of the leaders that um, are the most effective are always, always, always focused on the system and equities and not individual issues. So this director of special education, she called it system comebacks. And I'll read it to you and, and just kind of talk through a little bit. And she said that we often hear that inclusion is great for most students, but it's just not for this one kid. And in response, we always refer to our definition that her team came up with of inclusive education and share that the focus is never on student deficit and always on the systems, supports, and structures of a building or a classroom. So instead of saying inclusion isn't right for the student, we instead say that our building system supports and structures are creating a barrier to include all students. And the focus is and should be on how do we fix those systems, those supports, and those structures rather than the student. And it helps to shift the culture of how we talk about some of the challenges related to inclusion as well. Now, committing to professional development for everybody is part of the support. Commit to connection, right? That's staying as long as it takes, thinking about the well being, thinking about validating people's concerns, and really that understanding what are the supports that we need to provide, and remembering to come back to your vision, to your action, to your data around why we're moving in this direction. Building in time to practice and apply new learning. Providing differentiated and choice based PD and coaching, right? Having buy in to have folks really say, we want to be supported with co-teaching. We want to be supported with universal design and really allowing teachers to guide the work is the most powerful way to think about professional development. Providing iterative, timely, and meaningful feedback. If we set up a more inclusive structure, even in little pockets in this building or in pockets in a district, uh, and then we don't have time to meaningfully engage with how it's going, what is the feedback, what are the expectations? What supports can be provided? Um, the momentum can, can struggle and fail. You want to get creative with your time and your methods because we know time is the most precious resource we have. So thinking about how we provide support. Um, and often what this can look like is if you have a vision and you're thinking about this is your vision, everybody has to be part of the work. Um, and you don't want to, again, continue to silo your staff where these folks are doing something around PD and then your special educators are getting PD around co-teaching, but the general education teachers aren't there, right? We have to be really strategic and focused and universal around how we're thinking about this work. Um, I also always recommend thinking about networking for, for leaders, um, but also for teachers to really think about what's going well, what barriers are you running into, um, and really joining a support network in that way so that you can leverage each other's great work as well as talk about challenges. So in addition to support, you have to create genuine systems of celebration. And in some of the districts that I have uh, either worked with or that I've chatted with leaders from or educators from, um, the celebration of the good work of inclusion is such a key piece of what they like to talk about. Um, now, throw a rainbow milestone party is a little bit of a joke that my co-authors and I created because our milestones in the book are, are rainbow colored. And so we were like, oh, throw a rainbow milestone party. So if anybody's going to go through the milestones and then you want to throw a rainbow milestone party, let us know. Um, but things that have happened in districts that we've worked with or that we've heard about, you know, holding thankathons and really talking about all of the beautiful ways folks are including and collaborating and working together, hosting data days where not only is it sort of like, let's take a look at our data, but let's celebrate our data and talk about it and look at vertical alignment, um, share highlights with the community so that those successes and those highlights um, can build a ripple effect. Host recommitment meetings. And this is something that one building particularly did. They set up their vision. They were on year three or four of sort of doing this work. And 
it can be a grind, you know, education can be challenging. And they came back together to do a recommitment to thinking about inclusion. Um, and it was really powerful for them. So whatever it might be, really thinking about how are we building it in in meaningful ways that feel regular and sustained. So folks, that brings us to the end. I'm gonna remind you that you can go get um, resources, particularly from the book. So thinking about the milestones, um, thinking about scheduling, thinking about mapping, thinking about data review, all of these are gonna be there. Uh, but if you also want additional resources, oh, of course my, let me fix this so you can see it, maybe. Oh no, play from current slide. The book is gonna go into lots of detail around these pieces, but I'd also love to connect with you um, and you can learn more about what we're doing at the state level, uh, how University of Maine system are creating different supports to create greater inclusion. So you can email me directly. Uh, you can email Anne Marie uh, who, who, who was on the email for hosting this webinar, and I know we'll be sending out the recording as well as the resources to everybody who's registered. Um, thank you so, so much for joining me today. And I am excited about uh, the different questions and ideas and next steps you might take related to creating more inclusion for all learners. Thank you so much.